cultivating loving kindness. Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Homage to the Blessed, Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. What is metta? Metta is a Pali word which is most frequently translated as loving kindness or loving friendliness. We would all probably agree that these are very nice sounding words. These words are often used to describe an especially pure and wholesome emotion or state of mind which is intentionally cultivated by wise meditators. Unfortunately, however, these simple words do not come anywhere near describing the power of metta or the vital role that cultivating this quality plays in the process of purifying the mind. At first glance, this quality that we call loving-kindness could seem somewhat saccharine or wishy-washy. But fortunately for us, the Buddha in his great wisdom emphasized this quality in his teachings so that his followers would not make the mistake of overlooking its cultivation. Metta starts as a pure and kind intention. Then it becomes a wholesome and uplifting emotion. Through continued cultivation, this pure emotion of loving-kindness eventually becomes a powerful type of wholesome concentration. Developing this type of concentration can play an enormously helpful role in the ongoing process of mental development because it encourages that which is good and skillful and turns away from that which is not. But in order to truly understand this heart-based quality, we must look quite deeply and we must look from a place deep within our own hearts. And we might also look to the example of those in the world who have actually cultivated this quality. In Thailand, there are certain monks who are very famous for their development of the quality of loving-kindness in particular. Some of these monks spend much of each day receiving guests and accepting offerings from the faithful. I would suggest here that this is not for their own sakes, but rather for the purpose of encouraging others. The large numbers of people who make the effort to pay their respects to these monks is astonishing, and an onlooker can easily observe that for the most part, all of the people who come within close proximity to these meditation masters walk away smiling radiantly, feeling blessed simply to have had the opportunity to pay respects and to have received the goodwill radiating from the minds of such beings. Loving kindness touches people very, very deeply. Metta is both beautiful and profound. It is soft and yet extremely powerful. It is at once gentle and utterly transformative. And most significantly of all, in its pure form, it is non-personal and completely impartial. One prominent example of someone who exhibits a lot of this quality of metta in this day and age is His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. You will notice that wherever His Holiness goes in the world, many thousands of people go to listen to or simply to see Him. It should be noted that a large percentage of these people are not actually Buddhist practitioners. I personally suspect that many of these people are intuitively drawn in a way that they cannot quite describe or understand. Somehow, it just feels important and uplifting to witness and be near to such a kind, warm, forgiving and optimistic person. People feel that the Dalai Lama sees what is good in them. He sees their potential and he wishes to encourage it, and this is a tremendous blessing. And so the Dalai Lama is a very good example of a person who demonstrates a lot of this quality. Most of the people who meet this simple monk, from prime ministers and royalty to children and little old ladies in the street, feel that he truly wishes them well. Loving kindness as a spiritual quality sees what is good. 
It encourages and it blesses, and it can be developed boundlessly, for one and for all. And of course there are many other less famous nuns and monks, and gifted lay practitioners as well, still living in the world today, who have developed loving-kindness to an extraordinary degree, and who share the blessings of this quality with all who they meet. In an effort to make this subject a little more relevant, I would like to ask you a personal question now. Think for a moment. Who is it who has touched you most deeply in this lifetime? Or, who do you consistently remember with joy and deep gratitude? I expect that the people who have touched you most deeply in your life are people who demonstrated or shared this particular quality with you in some way or other. The people who radiate and act from the heart of loving kindness are usually the ones who we remember with gratitude, with a smile and warmth in our hearts. The very thought of them brightens the mind. Considering these things, hopefully now you have a little more of a sense for this quality called metta. And moving now from the personally profound to the very profound, what did the Buddha, our refuge as Buddhist practitioners, have to say about loving kindness? At one time, when some monks were having difficulties living comfortably in forests, due to interferences from resident ghosts and malicious spirits, the Buddha spoke the discourse on loving kindness, and he told the monks that they should recite this sutta frequently in their various forest abodes. When they did so, it was discovered that all previous unpleasant interferences were quickly dispelled. It is understood that contemplating the benefits of metta and setting the intention to cultivate this quality has a highly protective influence in people's lives on many levels and endears one both to seen and unseen beings, it is said. Many monks and nuns and devout lay people throughout the Theravadan world still recite this sutta frequently to this day. The Buddha also instructed his disciples that it was their duty to radiate loving-kindness in all directions every single day, especially towards the village upon which they were dependent for alms food. And in one sutta, the Buddha states quite pointedly that he knows of no other quality more conducive to heavenly rebirth than the cultivation of loving-kindness meditation. Personally, I am confident that when the Buddha speaks in such a manner, his meaning is literal, and not just an artful metaphor. In other suttas, the Buddha explains that sadly, most beings in samsara have been reborn in realms lower than the human realm. And yet the Brahma realms some of the highest and purest of the realms in the conditioned universe are inhabited by beings who have cultivated the quality of loving-kindness in particular. For those who are open to this aspect of the Buddha's teaching, these statements certainly do suggest that we are talking about extremely powerful causes and conditions here. So okay, perhaps metta is very powerful, but we are serious practicing Buddhists, and we don't actually want to be reborn in some remote and lofty region of heaven, only to have to be reborn again and again. We want to be liberated. Fair enough. But even so, I would like to suggest that we all do need to cultivate this quality of loving-kindness to some significant degree in our practice, as a tool that will aid us on our path towards liberation, perhaps not to the level of the purest and highest angels, but certainly to the level of a truly benevolent human being. If we are honest, most of us will admit that we still have some work to do here. In one sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, in a conversation with a Brahmin, the Buddha explains that he himself radiates loving-kindness to the people in the village upon which he is dependent for alms. Having done this, he radiates it in a second direction, a third direction, a fourth direction, above and below, around and everywhere. He continues by telling the Brahman, The whole world I suffuse with a heart grown great with loving-kindness, free of enmity, 
and untroubled. Considering that this is the Buddha talking here, completely liberated and foremost among fully enlightened beings, given that he too inclined his mind towards loving-kindness, radiating it to all beings in all directions, even in his final birth after enlightenment, we can certainly feel confident of both the wholesome and beneficial nature of this quality of mind. Given all of this, many people may still be wondering, as Buddhist practitioners in this day and age, do we actually need to cultivate metta? Well, if you are one of the rare beings who was simply born with a lot of this quality already, then perhaps you don't need to spend so much time on this. But if you are like me, that is to say, your mind is still affected by greed and attachment and occasional sticky forms of anger and aversion, then the cultivation of this quality is essential. One very renowned teacher, who I once stayed and practiced with in Thailand, teaches his monks that they should definitely practice metta at times, because it cleans out or washes away the defilements. It has a pacifying and sublimating influence upon the mind. And actually, even for people who naturally possess a lot of this quality, learning to refine and cultivate it further within the focus and discipline of formal meditation is extremely beneficial. Ajahn Pasano, co-abbot of Abhayagiri Monastery in Redwood Valley, California, said the following in a talk that he gave to lay people about metta and other Brahmavihara mind states. The whole point of the Buddha's teaching is to cultivate mental qualities in order to gain happiness of mind. And the Brahmaviharas, a prime source for creating happiness, can thus lay the foundation for the entire practice. Loving-kindness is one of the four Brahmaviharas. Looked at holistically, true happiness according to the Buddhist path is based upon the well-being which comes from being generous and kind, and the freedom of remorse which comes from maintaining virtuous conduct, as well as from the wholesome mental qualities which are developed through meditation. This is the threefold training. Being generous is an expression of loving-kindness towards oneself and towards others, and so is refraining from harmful and unskillful activities. But in our meditation, we cultivate metta even further by generating it in the mind as a pure emotion, then developing, refining and expanding upon it in a concentrated way. Later in the same talk, after describing the progression of qualities which lead to samadhi, concentration, Arjan Pasno paraphrases the process with the following pertinent statement. We see that happiness brings about samadhi, whereas usually we approach it the other way around. We often think, if only I could get my meditation together, then I would be really happy. Whereas it should be, how do I gain true happiness so that my heart could be at ease? Cultivating loving-kindness in the mind, as well as speaking and acting from the heart of metta, is a major ingredient for experiencing well-being. I would like to talk a little more specifically now about why metta is useful as a component in our meditation practice. It seems to be the case that most modern meditators' minds will not simply settle down easily and stay with the breath in every meditation session. Most modern people with busy and complicated lives, will find that they need a variety of tools and techniques in order to be able to bring their minds into balanced and peaceful states. Learning to use different methods and techniques at different times, depending upon what seems appropriate or effective. When we become skilled at picking up a wholesome meditation object, such as loving-kindness, we can then apply this in various ways within our practice. For example, if we notice that the mind is obsessing about something unskillful, we can decide to consciously turn the mind towards loving-kindness practice. We can pick up this alternative, wholesome, mental object as a way of prying the mind's sticky hands off of the more dangerous mental object. Developing these types of skills can save us a lot of time and relieve us of a lot of unnecessary suffering. Of course, becoming skilled at generating loving-kindness at will is dependent upon a lot of repeated practice. But it is well worth it. Keep in mind, too, that metta-meditation is actually very pleasant. 
the Buddha called metta one of the sublime or divine abidings because of its inherently pleasant characteristics. I am confident that many people may already recognize the potential of this quality, yet I am also aware that many people may lack the confidence or the understanding of how to go about developing this quality in a disciplined way through repeated meditation practice. One of my primary aims in producing this CD of guided meditations was to give meditators clear instructions, encouragement, and clear examples of methods and techniques which can be developed, so that they might feel more confident about cultivating metta practice further. In the loving-kindness section of this CD, I have offered several examples of techniques, which are clearly labeled. Within each of the meditations, there are progressive stages which are clearly explained and described at a comfortable and unhurried pace. Each metta meditation is presented in a simple and encouraging way, so you can feel confident that through repeated practice, you can definitely become more skilled in generating this quality in your own mind. You can also feel confident that the more you cultivate this quality in formal meditation sessions, the more this quality will naturally overflow into your daily life. It is the experience of many that those who cultivate metta definitely become kinder and happier people. In the guided meditations that I have presented, we will begin by learning how to hold the kind and pure thoughts and feelings of loving-kindness directed towards ourselves. We do this by simply generating a warm and kind feeling in the area of our own heart, and by repeating simple phrases in conjunction with the in and out breathing, which remind us of our intention. Some people may have some resistance to this at first, but it is in fact an essential step in cultivating this quality of metta, because it is from our own heart that we must learn to generate this quality outwards. It is necessary to fill our own heart with metta first, so that it can then overflow outwards in all other directions. No one should think that having loving-kindness for oneself is selfish. I would suggest that when we truly know how to take care of ourselves, we will in fact be more capable of genuinely caring for others. But sadly, and somewhat strangely, many people have learned to withhold this quality from themselves, and have a habit of judging and criticizing themselves consistently and over harshly instead. This can be very exhausting and painful, but it is important to be optimistic and to understand that these kinds of mental habits can definitely be brought back into balance. When we develop loving-kindness for ourselves, it is not that we overlook our faults, but rather that we learn to see them in a kinder and wiser perspective. We do not reject our innate goodness or refuse to see our potential. We become much more willing to put past old judgments and perceptions behind us and to see the potential of each new day and of each new moment. We learn to work patiently in order to overcome our faults instead of rejecting ourselves and giving up before even trying. It really isn't so difficult to establish this quality towards oneself. If you can begin to recognize that you are also one being among the many suffering beings in the world, that you have your own type of difficulties and struggles, and your own particular types of suffering, as well as hopes and aspirations for lasting happiness. Once you truly and deeply recognize the validity of your own wish for happiness, with a little training and encouragement, your own heart can learn to respond by sending forth vast stores of blessings and goodwill, becoming a deep source of nourishment for your spiritual journey. Once we are skilled in generating this quality of metta and pervading our own body and mind with it, we then move on to generating this quality towards others. The guided meditation will guide you in these steps. At first, we generate this quality towards those who we could easily feel loving kindness towards, our friends and close acquaintances, or dear family members. It is important here not to bring to mind anybody for whom we might feel a lot of sexual attraction. It's not that we shouldn't have loving kindness towards these people as well, it's just that if we think of these people in our meditation, 
our meditation will quite likely take a turn into the realm of sensuality. And this is not the pure type of love which we are aiming for in formal loving-kindness meditation. So try to stick with those people for whom you feel a paternal or maternal kind of loving-kindness towards, a brotherly or sisterly kind of love. After we become skilled at this, we then move on to include larger numbers of more neutral people. We simply try to bring to mind those people for whom we might not feel anything in particular. The anonymous people who we pass on the street, or in elevators, or along hallways, etc. What we are doing here is learning how to make our ordinary quality of loving-kindness less constrained and conditioned. We are literally learning how to flex the heart-mind's muscles so that this pure emotion can become bigger and stronger so that it can grow to include more and more people. These are the initial loving-kindness practices. Once we have developed some skill in this meditation, we can then move on to the more advanced stages. The guided meditations will give you choices. You will be given the choice to end the meditation after the initial stages, or continue onwards to subsequent stages. The initial practice of generating loving-kindness for oneself goes for about 30 minutes. Continuing on to include a few people for whom it is easy and natural to feel loving-kindness towards, and for a larger number of more neutral people, takes another 20 minutes. The more advanced stage is then covered in the subsequent 20 minutes. The advanced stage is very similar to the previous ones, except that we try to include even larger numbers of neutral people, and then we also move on to generating loving-kindness towards the category of people for whom we might usually find it difficult to feel loving-kindness towards. This could include people who have harmed us in the past, or the people who for some reason or other may not wish us well in our lives, or those who we do not know, yet who we suspect or have heard have caused or are causing serious harm to others. We conclude all of the meditations by returning to the perception of ourselves and wishing ourselves well once again. It is important to understand that there is no particular hurry to move on to the more advanced practices. It is actually recommended that you take some time establishing the initial stages deeply before moving on to the more challenging stages. The growth of the pure emotion of loving-kindness is necessarily gradual. It takes time to generate new habits, and even longer to make these habits very deep so it is fine to turn the guided meditation off at the half-hour point, and to repeat the initial stages practice again and again over a long period before deciding to include the subsequent stages. Go at your own pace, and at a natural pace. The last step, cultivating goodwill for harmful or difficult people, can be a difficult step to take in the process of developing loving-kindness but it is important to understand that the more our mind becomes imbued with this quality, the more bright and happy we will feel. It is also important to understand that when we generate this quality of loving-kindness to people who have harmed us or who have harmed others, we are not actually condoning the unskillful acts which these people may have been involved in committing. We are simply wishing that these people could be well and happy. It might be helpful to give some thought here to what we might mean by these words well and happy. If these so-called difficult people were well and happy, it would most probably mean that they would abandon their unskillful behavior, because cruel or mean people are not actually well or happy. So when we make this simple wish, we are actually also wishing that these people might learn how to become good and kind people understanding that this is what would make it possible for them to become truly happy and well. During the meditation, we are not trying to think about exactly what these various types of difficult people should abandon. To do so might risk giving rise to unskillful emotions and attitudes such as self-righteousness, which is not an aspect of loving-kindness. There are no pulpits or soapboxes in meta-meditation. 
We don't need to be concerned with any particular time frame either. When these people eventually get around to abandoning their unskillful habits is not actually our concern. During our metta meditation, we are simply and sincerely learning to wish all beings well, and we are practicing establishing this deep goodwill and pure intention in our own hearts first. Of course it is also equally important to understand that when we increase our loving kindness to include more neutral people and more difficult people, we are not trying to suspend our intelligence or wise discrimination. In our everyday lives, we still have to be cautious and careful with regards to who we allow ourselves to associate with or become close to. But even if we do not like or trust somebody, we can still ultimately wish them well, and this is actually an act of kindness to ourselves. Once people learn how to generate loving kindness towards all beings, they can become much, much happier. For in doing so, we relieve ourselves of the heavy burden of carrying around anger and grudges. Of course it is true that on one level, some people seem to enjoy being spiteful or holding a grudge. But the narrow and mean happiness that comes from spite pales in comparison to the deep and vast happiness which can arise from a heart grown large with loving kindness. There are potentially many benefits which can come from the cultivation of this practice. I will give a simple example now from my own practice. Many years ago, one of my teachers in Thailand, Venerable Ajahn Anand, a senior disciple of Ajahn Chah, encouraged me to begin each meditation sitting with a five-minute session of loving-kindness practice. I soon noticed that whenever I did this, that there would be less physical pain in my body, and that the usual hindrances to peacefulness would be less coarse. Subsequently, feeling much gratitude to Ajahnan, Nan, I made this a consistent part of my daily practice. I would like us to consider now the value of cultivating loving-kindness within the more mundane, yet perhaps equally important realm of human psychology. Generating this quality of loving-kindness can definitely assist meditators in healing the various types of psychological wounds that can affect human beings. For although metta is ultimately an impersonal quality, it tends to have a powerful healing effect upon the people who cultivate it enabling them to feel more whole and truly human. Many psychological wounds arise from experiences which leave people feeling abused, neglected or unloved. But once a person becomes skilled at generating the heart of loving kindness, such feelings are able to arise, heal and then simply fall away. This is one of the very pleasant and useful benefits that can arise from this practice. Pleasant because it can alleviate or reduce a certain type of suffering, and useful because good mental health is the best foundation for ongoing spiritual practice. So let us return now to considering the quality of loving-kindness in terms of it being a meditation object. When talking about metta in the sense of it being a type of meditation cultivated by Buddhists, essentially what we are talking about here is a type of concentration or samadhi, Metta starts as kind intentions, kind thoughts, and wholesome loving feelings. Then, as it becomes more refined and powerful, this quality has the power to gather the mind into itself in an upright and wholesome way. All meditators can develop a deeper concentration through practicing repeatedly with meditation objects such as metta. As Buddhist practitioners, it is essential to understand that it is the integrity and uprightness of samadhi that can give us the center of spacious clarity from which to see things less in terms of the self. A clear and calm mind is the best foundation for developing wisdom or engaging in deep contemplation. Learning how to collect the mind in wholesome states of concentration is one of the primary goals of our meditation practice. At the same time, when the mind becomes clarified and fortified by a profoundly concentrated, wholesome emotion, we will tend to make better choices in our lives, choices which bring benefit to ourselves and others. In the initial stages of our practice, our metta might not be so concentrated, 
But such is the power and virtue of this sublime emotion that even a little bit of metta can make a big difference in our lives. If you could become skilled at generating a mental attitude of true loving kindness towards yourself, you could then take this quality with you wherever you have to go in the world. Once you have cultivated metta, when you are lonely or confused, you can be kind to yourself. If someone else is unkind to you, you can forgive them quickly and easily and remain kind to yourself. When the external world seems harsh and frighteningly impersonal, you can be a friendly refuge for yourself. In establishing a kind, sane and healthy center in the middle of your life, the whole world suddenly seems much less crazy and threatening. Cultivating the heart imbued with loving-kindness can be of enormous assistance in maintaining a healthy sense of well-being. In ending this talk, I would like to talk in a little more specific detail with regards to the series of guided meditations offered in the Metta section of this CD, so that you will have a better idea of what has been presented here for your exploration. Some meditators find that they get best results with very simple and repetitive techniques. With this in mind, I have presented a Metta practice which utilizes frequent repetition of specific phrases designed to stimulate a warm feeling of Metta in the mind. We begin by making these wishes for ourselves, and then, using the same phrases, we then bring other people and different classes of beings to mind. This meta-meditation is qualified in the title as Loving-Kindness Meditation, Heart-Focused. Some people's minds are quite visual. With this in mind, I have also presented several different visualization-based meta-practices. One involves visualizing a lotus in the heart, imagining it blossoming and then radiating loving-kindness outwards in the form of golden light to various classes of beings. In this meditation, we are still aiming at generating a warm feeling of loving-kindness at the heart, but we are using a visual tool to stimulate the process. This meditation is qualified in the title as being a visualization with a lotus. In another metta-visualization meditation, as a way of incorporating some Buddha nusati, that is, the practice of recollecting the example and qualities of the Buddha, I am leading the meditator in a visualization where one sees, pays respects, and makes offerings to the newly enlightened Buddha under the Bodhi tree. In this meditation, one is encouraged to contemplate the radiant and loving kind presence of the Buddha, foremost in the world in loving kindness, before turning one's own mind towards generating metta. This is one powerful way of setting the tone or resonance for metta practice. Sometimes, opening the heart with faith and appreciation can be a good way to incline the mind towards loving-kindness. Likewise, generating the heart of loving-kindness can be helpful in deepening and strengthening the mind of faith. These heart-based qualities support one another. Also with a similar theme, there is a metta-meditation where you will be guided in meeting, paying respects to, and recollecting the example of Mahapajapati, the first bhikkhuni. This meditation combines sanghanusati with metta practice, recollecting an inspiring member of the sangha. In this meditation, we find Mahapajapati bhikkhuni seated in the meditation posture under an ancient banyan tree, accompanied by several other bhikkhunis, radiating love and kindness throughout the world. Inspired by her example, we then turn our minds to metta. Each meditation is clearly titled on the contents page, so I suggest exploring the ones which you think would most likely bring the best results for your character. Simply give them a try and see how they go. If you are not familiar with a particular method, it might be worth trying it several times before moving on to another, giving the method a sincere trial. After having explored the CD at your own pace, once you find a method which seems to work for you, try to stick with that particular method in a disciplined way for some time. And once you have internalized the method, feel free to do away with the guided meditations altogether and do it by yourself. Initially, 
Some people might find that they can occasionally have some reactions after generating loving-kindness deeply in the heart. It is rare, but sometimes meditators can feel a bit grumpy after doing metta practice. Similarly, old griefs and painful memories can occasionally burst into the mind during or after a session of metta. If this ever happens to you, please do not lose heart. I would encourage you to see this kind of experience as being part of a process of purification or healing. Sometimes, metta meditation moves things which were stuck somehow. Try to see metta as a cool but strong breeze blowing away dust in the mind, and feel confident that over time the general trend will be towards more happiness, contentment and brightness. And equally important, if any painful memories do come up, Try not to get lost in any of the stories about the past, why it shouldn't have been the way it was, or how things should have been. Remember that Ajahn Chah used to say that one of the most important things to learn in our practice is how to let go. He would say, if it isn't good, let it die. If it doesn't die, then make it good. The past is gone. Leave it where it is. Feel the present with mindfulness and loving-kindness. And so lastly, I would like to wish you all every success in your metta meditation practice, keeping in mind that success as a meditator does not necessarily mean remarkable or blissful meditation all of the time. What we are aiming for in our practice, along with peacefulness and joy, is a growth in mindfulness, a growth in patience, a growth in wisdom, and a growth in discipline and commitment as well. And so may we all continue to grow in these wholesome and beautiful qualities. Be well.